So I'm going to talk to you more about the ocean. Um, the Arctic Ocean is becoming warmer, fresher and more acidic. You can see in these two plots here, the top panels, that the Arctic surface water has warmed since the 1980s. In, the, in winter, in the panel on the left, the sea ice extent is greatest, but there is still a warming trend in the European sector of the Arctic, which is marked in red. But the greatest warming trend that we see is of about half a degree per decade, um, and that's occurring in the summer during the sea ice minimum, which is the panel on the right. As we've heard um, just before this, ocean warming is amplified by ice loss feedback on albedo. So white ice reflects heat, dark ocean absorbs more heat, but in turn that ice loss amplified by increasing ocean heat transport into the Arctic. So ocean warming and ice loss are very interlinked and feedback on each other. They also have other ocean impacts. For instance, they're resulting in increased river runoff, and this can cause freshening of the ocean, which is a particular concern in the Arctic because so many rivers run into the Arctic. This in turn impacts on carbon and nutrient budgets, and that can have knock-on implications for the food web. All of these aspects can be significantly reduced under low emission scenarios. So again, on the bottom panels, we have the future projections. In blue is the low emission scenario or one and a half degree world. And that's compared to the red lines with the high emission scenarios or a three and a half degree world. But ocean acidification, um, so this is a process where carbon dioxide into the ocean. It alters the marine carbonate chemistry to produce a weak acid called carbonic acid. Colder, fresher waters are more susceptible to ocean acidification because of their lowered ability to buffer changes in acidity, but also because they actually absorb more CO2 gas. A change in acidity is it can impact organisms and species on many different levels, but the most obvious is that carbonic acid is essentially corrosive to calcium carbonate minerals. So any organism that produces carbonate shells or skeletons such as a mussel, a clam, an oyster or a coral, they're going to be susceptible to these corrosive waters, making it more difficult for them to build shelves or repair their structures, and much more likely that any exposed structures will actually dissolve. So as you can see on these figures, the red on these maps shows the extent of corrosive waters. And by the end of the century, in a high emissions world, we expect almost all of the Arctic and all of the Southern Ocean surface waters to be corrosive to these minerals all year round. In a emissions world, we can prevent that from happening in most of the Arctic and all of the Southern Ocean. So they will not face those corrosive conditions if we keep to a low emissions pathway. But in fact, already today, we see areas of corrosive water in the polar regions that appear seasonally and are causing damage to organisms. So we have observational evidence that this is a problem. Here is an example of a pteropod, which is a small free swimming snail, which is a primary food source for many fish, including salmon. You can see in these pictures pitting and areas of shell that are actually dissolving under today's CO2 levels. A key take home message here is that acidification can only be reduced by reducing CO2 emissions. It's interlinked intermittently with how much CO2 is in the atmosphere going into the ocean. But it will take light likely take thousands of years for carbonate chemistry to return to its present state. As shown here, we're in the year 2500 and with zero emissions after the year 2100, pH levels are actually only just increasing a little bit. And as shown here, we can see that it takes in the order of tens to thousands of years to get back to near present day conditions. Finally, we can look at an example of how these changes might impact an important ecologically um, and regionally relevant fish species, um, the cod. So freshening will change the nutrient budget, which could impact plankton production and alter food availability. We've got ocean acidification, which could change um, cod reproduction. It's been shown to negatively affect reproduction in cod. And this will force cod to populations to stay further south. Uh, warming waters will bring southern species in and push cod further north, and this kind of sandwiches or restricts the cod populations to very small amounts of habitat. A recent modelling study actually looked at the implications of warming and acidification on cod stocks and determined that both of these stresses together would put fisheries at risk of collapse under high emission scenarios which will mean that fishing act activities need to be drastically reduced in order to sustain any profitability of that stock.
So to conclude, keeping emissions to a level equivalent to a one and a half degree world is absolutely vital for minimizing the risks to polar ocean ecosystems and the services that they provide us.